riding at zone two one hour into a ride versus riding at zone two five hours in or into a ride is obviously different. And yeah. and yeah, if you ride at zone two for long enough, you're gonna you're gonna create that stress as well. How much endurance is too much endurance? If we stay within endurance zone, can we just ride endless hours with no negative effects? I mean, it is just endurance. You can do endurance forever, right? Is it a matter of more is always better, or is there a limit to actually how much endurance our bodies can handle? These are the questions that I wanna to try to answer in today's video. Yeah. When I talk about the endurance zone, what I'm talking about is that training intensity zone, usually called zone two, where an athlete can do this style of riding or this intensity of riding for all day kinds of rides, and this should be a big portion of their training volume. I mean, literally the word to endure means to continue in the same state. To get really specific, your endurance zone should be below your first ventilatory threshold, or VT1 for short. And your VT1 is also closely correlated to your first lactate turn point, or LT1. So whether you refer to it as VT1 or LT1, either way, it's low intensity. Now, the number one best way to try to figure out what your LT or VT1 is, so that you stay below it during your endurance rides, is to go to a lab and get tested. But that's not always an option for everybody. So there's actually two easy shortcuts we can do to get a rough estimate of our LT1. Number one is to take 75% of your max heart rate. So if your max heart rate is 200 beats per minute, this would give you a heart rate ceiling of about 150, which means you wouldn't want to go over 150 during your endurance rides. That's what I do. And those are roughly my numbers. Now, number two is to do the talk test. And this is actually seems kind of silly, but it is actually pretty accurate. If you can hold a conversation quite comfortably while you're riding, you're probably below LT1. Now, the reason you want your endurance rides to stay pretty mellow is because once you go above LT1, you start accumulating stress on your autonomic nervous system. This is called your ANS. Now, stress upon your ANS is good. You want to stress your body in ways because that's how it's gonna get stronger. You stress it, it recovers, it gets stronger. However, we can only do this about two times a week before it becomes too much for our bodies to handle. In this review by Dr. Steven Seiler, he writes, high intensity training is a critical component in the training of all successful endurance athletes. However, about two HIT training sessions per week seems to be sufficient for inducing physiological adaptation to performance gains without inducing excessive stress over the long term. So we must realize that high intensity interval training is a crucial part of our training program. You cannot just do endurance miles and expect to win races. You need intervals, you need that high intensity. However, our bodies can only handle so much of this high intensity training before it actually starts to hinder our performance. So if you think about your training in this way, then one of the main arguments that can be made about low intensity training is that you can actually do more of it with less overall stress on your body. Basically, if you can only do two high intensity training interval days a week, what do you do with the other five days? Well, high volume, low intensity training, endurance. Seiler goes on to say that in highly trained athletes, training more frequently and or for longer durations at relatively low exercise intensities may induce a lower overall stress load and facilitate more rapid recovery compared with highly intensive training sessions above the lactate threshold. Low intensity training means quicker recovery, which means we can do a whole lot more of it. However, there's one massive flaw with this conclusion. In the research conducted by Seiler himself, the training only goes up to two hours. And here's what we see in that research. Now, as you can see, there's a clear separation between the high intensity training and the low intensity training in the 30 minutes following exercise. However, when you get further out from the training, the 120 minute bout of low volume training is more aligned with the high intensity training than it is to the 60 minutes of low intensity. 
So can we just assume that as volume increases, recovery decreases? I don't quite know, and there's probably not enough research to make that conclusion. And to be quite honest, I don't even know how important your post-exercise 90-minute heart rate is, but I do think it's quite interesting that this was right here in the middle of that research article and nobody even said anything about it. And when I showed Dylan this chart and explained to him what I had seen, here's his reaction. If you look at 90 minutes, there's mm -hmm. a spike from where the the 120 minute below VT1 ride actually <laughs> spikes up and it's actually up there with the intervals, but the 60 minute ride is is down it stays down there. I'm like, how mm -hmm. could they not and all they talk and all they said in the article and I have it right here. They have one little sentence that says there was a tendency toward a rebound increase in parasympathetic tone observed after the below VT1 120 condition. And that's mm -hmm. all it says. <laughs> like, how could they yeah. ignore that? Yeah, no, I, uh, that's, that's interesting. I don't, I don't know what to say about that, to be honest with you. Oh, dang. That's definitely going in the video. I stumped <laughs> Dylan Johnson. Dude, you know how many videos I end with? Like, I don't know the answer to this, but here's what the, you know, here's yeah, what the true. research says. And the sad truth is that we just don't have enough research to make any conclusions here. We need more research with longer than two hours endurance training. And hopefully, and from what I've heard, Siler is actually conducting these studies right now. And mm -hmm. I thought that was pretty interesting. Like, I would really love to see something where it was like four hours. Like, what's your heart rate? What's your post-exercise mm -hmm. heart rate look like after a four-hour endurance ride? But... Obviously, yeah. they. I don't think there's a an article mm -hmm. that has that yet. Researcher Larson seems to agree with our conclusion when he writes that there are relatively few studies documenting improvements in performance with step increases in training volume. Now, I get this weird feeling that there might be this misunderstanding that increasing volume always leads to better endurance. And what I guess what I'm trying to say is that maybe I don't think that's true. Now, I recently read. 80-20 training by my boy Matt Fitzgerald. Good book, definitely recommend it. But towards the end of this book, he makes a pretty bold claim that had me scratching my head for several weeks. Here it is. Athletes got twice as much benefit from each additional minute of low intensity training in their program as they got from each additional minute of high intensity training. Now, if you're like me, then you read that sentence and your first thought is, Dang, I need to do more low intensity training. But I already do a lot of low intensity endurance miles. So is there a ceiling to this improvement or can you just keep doing it and doing it and doing it with no negative effects? What about that old saying that even too much of a good thing can be a bad thing? After I looked at that sentence for quite some time, I realized that there are two things that stood out to me that are pretty important that you can't overlook. The first word in that sentence is athletes. and Fitzgerald is writing about highly trained, top of their sport kinds of athletes, not the general public. And number two, that little word additional, additional. This is on top of an already periodized solid training plan that they're adding more volume into. Now, after a little more digging, I came across another quote in this book that I found very interesting. Research shows that low intensity training is truly a gift that keeps on giving. The more slow running you do, up to a point, of course, the more you get in return. Now, the part of that quote that really just irks me and boils my bubbles is that little comment in the middle where it says, up to a certain point, of course, as if we all know that doing too much endurance is actually detrimental, yet he just wrote an entire book trying to convince us to do more of it. So... Why would he put that in there and then not even talk about it? I mean, come on, dude, that's, that's frustrating. We have research that shows and proves an 80-20 distribution of intensity, meaning you should be doing 80% of your training at lower intensity and 20% at higher intensity, but that's percentage, not volume. We need a research article that talks about overall training volume. And what this would look like would be they track performance and all of these different training models or volumes would be an 80-20 proportion, but what would change is the overall weekly volume. I'm totally convinced that I should be on an 80-20 training intensity distribution. What I wanna know is 
how many hours a week do I train? And that's a bit more complicated to answer. So here's where I've landed. I think that our training needs three things. It needs high intensity training, you need low intensity endurance miles, and you need recovery. And as long as you have those three things, I think adding volume is usually beneficial if it follows an 80-20 protocol. So with all of that being said, here are a few considerations as you play around with increasing your overall volume. There tends to be this mindset among endurance athletes that really long rides are easy if you stay within your endurance zone. And I just think that's baloney because I get to a, the end of a four or five or six hour ride and even if I did stay in endurance zone, I feel pretty fried at the end of that ride. I mean, Matt Fitzgerald even agrees with me in saying that even these easy runs should leave you with a feeling of fatigue at the end of them. We know that high intensity training creates stress upon your autonomic nervous system. I mean, this was the biggest point in Siler's 2007 research article that we looked at earlier. But I think it should be stated that if you ride endurance for long enough, this too will accumulate stress upon your ANS. When you ride your bike harder or longer, stress will be accumulated. What really matters is how quickly you can recover from that stress. I, I tried to research this, but um, either I'm not good at finding research articles or I'm just lazy. So I figured I could just ask my friend who has all these research articles memorized. Um, here's my question. Mm -hmm. You talk a lot about the autonomic nervous system. Mm -hmm. And I've heard you say this. You can accept or deny this, that the autonomic, autonomic nervous system stress that we accumulate is almost like a light switch that once you go over your LT or VT1, that stress starts accumulating, correct? So there's a, there's an interesting uh, research article by Steven Seiler that tests this and, you know, they look at the amount of autonomic nervous system stress from doing various intensities. I can't remember the exact study protocol off the top of my head. I don't have it in front of me, but they test um, to see the amount of autonomic nervous system stress at these various intensities. And it does seem like going above um, that first lactate turn point BT1 is kind of like the on off switch or you're on an autonomic nervous system. In fact, I think that's even the words that they use in the article. They use the words on off switch. Mm -hmm. So my question or what I've been trying to like dig into and figure out is if you do enough endurance and get fatigued enough, is there a point at which when you're doing endurance, you start to accumulate that autonomic nervous system stress? Because I don't know if at a certain point your um, cardiac drift gets high enough or whatever, fatigue just gets high enough to where then even though you're still in that endurance zone and be below LT1, your body is just so fatigued from doing it for so long that mm -hmm. now you're accumulating that ANS system or stress. Yes. So the answer to that is most likely yes. And that is the question that I asked Steven Seiler when I had him on my channel as well. And he, oh, so this I'm is interviewing a... the wrong person. I need to interview <laughs> Seiler. Gosh. I mean, these questions would be better answered by him for sure. So, <laughs> but he, these are questions that they're currently working on. Um, yeah, there are a lot of the... questions around zone two training that research is currently working to find the answer to. This is one right. of them, but yeah, writing, I mean, Riding at zone two one hour into a ride versus riding at zone two five hours in or into a ride is obviously different. And yeah. and yeah, if you ride at zone two for long enough, you're gonna you're gonna create that stress as well. So what does this mean for your weekly training plan? Well, what it means is that you still need recovery days. You can't just swap out all your recovery days for endurance rides. We still need to recover from our endurance rides as well as our intensity rides. And so what this looks like in my own training is that I usually try to plan it so that my intervals happen when I'm the most fresh. And then after that, I'll do my endurance ride because I always tend to think that you can still ride endurance if you're fatigued. And then after that, I'll do a recovery day. So this might look like Tuesday intervals, Wednesday, Thursday endurance, and then Friday recovery. 
It also seems as if athletes are getting so hyper-focused on volume that they aren't remembering how important intervals actually are. I mean, intervals are actually what elicit greater fitness gains and it's doing intervals that help us win races. I mean, intervals are so good that you only have to do two interval sessions a week to see huge performance increases. I'd even go so far to try to make the argument that if our bodies could handle more intervals, that that would actually be the best way to train. However, the sad truth is our body can't handle that much high intensity, only about two or three sessions a week. So maybe we should think of our training with the main focus on those interval days, and then the volume comes in as a gap filler in between those high intensity days. So what does this mean for your weekly training plan? Well, it means that you shouldn't do so much volume that it negatively impacts your intervals. If you've got intervals Saturday, but you're still recovering from your Thursday endurance ride because you rode for way too long, then maybe you overdid it and you need to back down that endurance ride Thursday. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that you need to give your intervals the priority that they deserve, meaning you want your intervals to always occur on the day that you're gonna feel the most fresh, usually the day after recovery day. So yes, increasing volume is good for performance, within reason. By the way, within reason has probably been one of my favorite things to say over the last few weeks. I mean, it's only two words, but it, it's like, it's so good when you say them. It's like, it's like you get to say to somebody, all your wildest dreams will come true within reason. Or you walk into an all you can eat buffet and you can say, eat as much as you want within reason. So good. One of the biggest mistakes that you can make is increasing your volume too quickly and going into a state of overtraining or burnout. I mean, if you're only training about 10 hours a week and you bump that up to 20 hours a week in a short period of time, you're probably gonna suffer. I mean, progressive overload is a real thing and it's good and it's this idea or this the truth that you within your training plan you need to be increasing the intensity ever so slightly so that your body can adapt to those and get stronger. That's progressive overload. But on the extreme end of that, you've probably got excessive overload where you probably bit off a little bit more than you could handle. And this is a bad thing. And yes, I just made up that word, excessive overload. Pretty good, huh? If somebody asked you how much endurance is too much endurance, what would you say? Um, it depends on how fit you are. Mm. So the fitter you are, the more endurance you can handle. And I guess the, the point at which it's too much endurance is the point at which you're overtraining. Now, if you forced me to put a number on it, then I'd say be careful in adding more than three hours of volume to your weekly training hours. And when you are increasing your volume, I'd even recommend keeping a log or tracking how you feel with those increases. You could do this via Training Peaks comments, or if you're old school, yes, I'm about to say that you could maybe even write it down with pen and paper in a training journal. Yeah. So I, I have heard people, I have heard coaches say that a ride over six hours is not beneficial. Mm. I don't know where they're getting that from. I don't know if there's yeah. any research about that. I don't know if that's just like one of those old wise tales. Right. Uh, the only thing that so. I could find when I read was, and I think I read this in one or two different spots where it said you should, your longest endurance ride should be equal to should be two hours or equal to your longest race. And I think that's duration, not distance. So like, I'm, yeah, but yeah. there's some people that do races that are so long that you can't do a ride that long. Yeah. Those are like the outliers. I think we're talking okay. about within the normal range of sure. most bike racers. Yeah. Yeah. Like for mm -hmm. everybody who's just doing normal road, road racing or crit racing okay. or gravel racing, you know, like not, not that many people are going to race more than 200 miles with Unbound being like their sure. biggest race. So if like if your estimated time at Unbound is 12 hours, I mean, that's even I mean, I feel like even that is an outlier. Like, I don't know if I would have somebody go do a 12 hour endurance ride on one ride, no. maybe maybe split it between two days and do yeah. those days back and forth, because that's just a lot. But yeah, um, unless they're just super fit. But yeah.
No, yeah. I probably wouldn't either have them do that. But if most people are just training for like a 60 mile road race and that road race is going to take three hours, then definitely they should be doing three hours because I think that's a lot more manageable. I agree. And if you really just don't want to deal with your overall training volume or the training intensity distribution and 80% this and 20% that and da 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 da, well then you should probably hire a coach. And I just so happen to know a really good coaching company, da 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 da, Ignition Coach Co. Developing coaches, connecting athletes. Me and Dylan are spending quality time with these coaches to get them to top-notch level to be able to provide you with an awesome coaching experience. So be sure to check out Ignition Coach Co. This is also the end of this video, so here are all the other ways that you could support me. You could subscribe to the channel, you share this video, like it, watch it, do all that stuff. If you wanna live a, a 20 in the tip jar, go over to Patreon, you can do that there. And if you're interested in some training plans, I've got those available on Training Peaks. All the links for these things are below. Thanks for watching. Y'all stay rad. Yeah.